My name is Dr. Brian Curran, as Anne said, and I'm a demographic historian and a local historian. Uh, and as Anne said, I was the census specialist on the Beyond 2022 project. And I would like to thank you all for coming out to listen to me tonight on this cold, frosty evening. This evening, I'm going to speak to you about an, uh, an important census which came to our attention during the course of our project. Now, the Beyond 2022 project uh, was a government-supported uh, project based in Trinity College, du uh, Dublin. It had five core archival partners, the National Archives of Ireland, the National Archives in London, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, the Irish Manuscripts Commission, uh, and the Library of Trinity College, uh, Dublin. And beyond these, there were many partners in supporting the institutions too around the world, uh, and we received great support from, from libraries, archives, and institutions in the course of our project. Now, um, the aim of the project was to reconstruct some contents from the Public Record Office, which was destroyed in the early years of the Irish Civil War. The, the Public Record Office, based in the Four Courts Complex on the Quays in Dublin, was established in the 1860s, and it held seven centuries of Irish historical records, including the census records, uh, the census returns from the first five Irish censuses held between 1813 and 1851. Now, the first attempt to uh, conduct a modern census in Ireland was held between 1813 and 1815. And embarrassingly for the Irish authorities, the census failed to enumerate the entire country. The census was supposed to take seven weeks to complete, but it dragged on for nearly two years before it was wound up. <laughs> Although the census was deemed a failure, the national population was de subsequently determined to be about six million people, just shy of six million people, based on comparative calculations founded on previous inquiries and on the partial results of, that, of the, the census. Kilkenny was poorly served by this census survey. The Grand Jury, an early local government body, uh, was responsible for appointing enumerators uh, at the Lent Assizes or Law Sessions of 1813. Most counties had a single Grand Jury, which was responsible for the entire county. Kilkenny had two, one for the county, and a separate one had responsibility for the city. Now, the city's Grand Jury, however, appears not to have appointed enumerators at all. They just ignored the act. And its population went uncounted in 1813. In the county, enumerators were appointed for all nine baronies, as was required by the act. And returns were presented at the summer assizes of 1813 for all nine areas. The nine sets of returns were sent to Dublin, but all were deemed to be objectionable and were returned to Kilkenny for rem remedy. Attempts were made to improve the returns, but when the enumeration process was eventually wound up in March 1815, almost two years after it commenced, the returns for only three southern baronies, Ida, Kells and Noctofer, and the returns for Callan Town and Liberties had been approved by census officials. The returns for all the other baronies in the county were deemed to contain some un unspecified incorrectness. That's what the I stands for in the image here, an incorrectness in the returns. So what does an incorrectness mean? It's important to note that acceptance of the returns by the administrative officers in Dublin was not an indication that the returns were being, were being viewed by the census officials as being accurate, but merely that their data were presented in the approved fashion. It's also important to note that if a return contained an incorrectness, as in the case of Crana, for example, and as you can see, Crana is spelled Grana, these, these are errors that were in the source, this did not mean that the return was inaccurate but just that the form of presentation did not satisfy the officials in the census office. So this means that we can't automatically accept figures for baronies which were accepted by the census officials, and neither should we reject the numbers for baronies with incorrectnesses. Now, after each census was, was held, 
official figures, an official report was then published by Parliament. And I brought along an example of the official publication for the 1821 census of Ireland, which I've left down on the desk down at the back there, which you're more than welcome to have a look at. So that's the official report for 1821, the second census. Because the 1813 to 1815 census was deemed to have been an embarrassing failure, however, no publication ever arose out of Westminster. And because Parliament did not publish an, a, an official census report for this census, we would have few figures from it. But by good fortune, the Census Commissioner, William Shaw Mason, the Census Commissioner in 1813, he was a pluralist office holder in the early years of the 19th century. And after the census, he attempted to orchestrate a parish survey of Ireland or a statistical survey of Ireland in the 1810s and it was meant to cover the entire island. Now, Shaw Mason's attempt at a parochial survey of Ireland also failed, but three volumes of parochial statistical accounts were published between 1814 and 1819. And I've brought along the first volume of uh, Mason's uh, parochial surveys, and it's down there on the desk as well, so you can have a look at that. Uh, if you're not familiar with this really, really important and useful publication, very important for uh, local history research. Since Shaw Mason, as a census commissioner, had access to the population returns from the census, he published the numbers in his volumes. So that's where the previous image came from, the, the published vol uh, population statistics for Kilkenny. If Shaw Mason hadn't published his parochial survey, those <laughs> figures wouldn't be available. Um, so since he had access to the population returns for the census, he published the numbers in his volume and some of the parish accounts contained population figures from the 1813 to 1815 census to parish and even to townland level. For County Kilkenny, five accounts were published in the three volumes covering nine parishes in the county. And these were for Fidown Union in southwest Kilkenny consisting of five parishes, Fidown, Owning, Tubrod, Whitechurch and Tibber Agney, um, Grange Sylvia and Kilmacahill in the east of the county, and in the west of the county or the northwest, Tullerone Parish. These parish accounts, many of which are informative, very informative and illuminating, often present 1813 census data, and sometimes, as in the case of Fidown Union, they present the data to townland level, right? After this, after 18, from 1813, no townland, no census published townland figures until 1841. So these are very early townland population figures from a census. And these accounts are wonderful, so can be wonderful uh, sources for the local and the regional historian. Now, the second census of Ireland then was held in 1821. And this was held contemporaneously with a census in Britain, the third census in Britain, because Britain was enumerated in 1801, 1811, and then in 1821. So 1821 represented the second attempt to enumerate the Irish and the third attempt to enumerate Britain. The Irish census was groundbreaking in the UK context because it was the first statutory census held on either island which attempted to record the names of all inhabitants uh, throughout in the country, although the names of servants and households were sometimes omitted. But earlier censuses in Britain and in Ireland, the 1813 to 1815 Irish survey, had only required the enumerators to return raw numbers but 1821 required the enumerators to record all names. Commonly viewed as Ireland's first successful census, this survey reported the national population at 6.8 million people. <coughs> and with Britain's population being determined at 14.4 million, Ireland was contributing almost one third to the population of the United Kingdom as then constituted. 
and the equivalent statistic today would be at about 11 or 12 percent. So here it was about 32 percent. So Ireland was a much more significant part uh, proportionately of the population of the two islands than it is today. In Kilkenny, the population of the, of the, of the county, exclusive of the, the county of the city, was reported at 158,716, or at 100, or the population of the county was 181,946, with the city's 23,230 people included. And the population of Kilkenny in, in uh, 1821 was sig significantly larger than the 103,683 that was reported by the census last year. So almost 80,000 more people were living in County Kilkenny in 1821 than in 2022. The population of the city to street level was published in a major Dublin newspaper, Faulkner's Dublin Journal. So there's an example of it for St. John's Parish, giving the number of houses and the number of inhabitants to uh, street level uh, in, the, in the city. So very detailed source for anybody interested in the history of the city. Now, the survival of 1821 census information for County Kilkenny is better than for most other counties in Ireland, thanks to the work of two great historians of the county. Edmund Walsh Kelly, a genealogist with an interest in the Aglish Portna Scully, Scully area in, south, in the south of the county, uh, was one. And Walsh Kelly transcribed the complete census returns from 1821, 1831, 1841, and 1851 for Aglish and Portna Scully parishes. And those transcripts are available in the National Library of Ireland. And it's worth noting that, that, that Aglish and Portna Scully is the only part of Ireland for which 1821, 31, 41, and 51 census returns are available in transcription form. Of course, the originals have been destroyed. The originals were destroyed in 1922. And the second uh, historian of, 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 of significant note was Father William Carrigan, the parish priest of Durrow Parish, straddling the Kilkenny leash border. And uh, as you know, the author of The History and Antiquity, Antiquities of the Diocese of Ossory, a four volume publication which was published in 1905. And Carrigan spent considerable time in the public record office in Dublin at the beginning of the 19th century, extracting copious amounts of material from various types of sources, including from the census, for his magnificent four-volume diocesan history. Carrigan's notebooks, 168 of them, I believe, can be accessed in St. Ciaran's College, Kilkenny City, and here we can see an image from one notebook showing the 1821 census entry for Father William Carroll, parish priest of Inishteague Parish. Living with him was his curate, John Quinn, his coadjutor, and two servants. And it's, we don't actually know whether the names of the servants were recorded in the census or if Carrigan just noted their presence. Because Car Carrigan, of course, he was interested in the priests and he transcribed a lot of the census entries for the priests. So in, the, in this case, he may just have taken the names of the two priests and ignored the names of the two servants or else they might not have been recorded. So um, Carrigan's uh, transcription for Inish Teague, I think it's in notebook 10 uh, of his, his um, notebooks in uh, St. Ciaran's College. And Car uh, Carl was living in Kilcross <laughs> Townland. And here we see a part of Walsh Kelly's type transcription for part of Aglish Parish. It's Curlody Townland uh, in Aglish in South Kilkenny. And just look at the information that's recorded here for, for each, uh, each household. It gives you names. The first one is for the McGrath family. You may not be able to see it, but it's the McGrath family. It gives ages. So Philip McGrath was 60. 
It gives uh, occupations. He was a farmer. It gives acreages. He was farming eight acres. And it gives relationships. It, tell, it tells you the name of his wife and it tells you the name of his, his son. It tells you the name of his son's wife and then his son and wife's uh, children or his grandchildren. Um, the 1821 census, because it recorded the names of all inhabitants, or aimed to record the names of all inhabitants, it was truly one of the great surveys of early 19th century Ireland. Uh, and that's the type of information that you can simply extract from this. If you have, if you have uh, census transcriptions for an area, you can build up family trees uh, quite easily. So that's 1821, one of the great censuses of Ireland. Now, the third census of Ireland, the third national census, from which the 1831 census of Woodstock was extracted, and the reason why you're here tonight listening to me this evening, uh, occurred in 1831. This was the third Irish census and was, I would argue, the most fascinating of all Ireland censuses either before or since. It was less ambi um, ambitious than the 1821 enumeration, whereas the 1821 census had required the names of all inhabitants to be recorded. Well, that was a very, very costly undertaking. The 1831 survey only recorded the names of the householders in every house. Typically, it was the, the head of the house, and that was usually, in, in most cases, that was a male and it connect, uh, collected just numerical information for the other occupants in the house. So whereas 1821 recorded about 6.8 million names, 1831 only recorded about one and a quarter million names because it was just recording the householders. Here's an example from, uh, again, from the Walsh Kelly notebooks in the National Library for Aglish Parish, this time for Aglish Townland. And it gives, uh, and you can see it's much less detailed than 1821. Like this is a transcription of what would have been there in, 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 in previous to the destruction of the census. It gives only one line for each person, uh, for each household, and then gives the number of males and the number of females, the number of males over 20, and the number of servants. So that's more or less what it was giving. So it's far less detailed. Thomas Delahunty, for instance, his... 15 strong household, contained six males uh, and nine females. Two of the males were 20 years or older and two of the 15 people in the households were servants. And you can see that if you were using this for genealogical research, if you were in the public record office previous to 1922 <coughs> and you were trying to use this for genealogical research, it's much less use useful than the 1821 census because if you're Delahunt you're not going to know whether you're you're possibly not going to know whether your ancestors were Thomas or John or Patrick or Ellen or Patrick or Edmund or Margaret or Richard <laughs> whereas from 1821 you do have the the, the uh, names of all the, uh, the the members of the household and it's much more suitable much more uh, suitable as a research tool and much more useful as a research tool. Imagine if you were researching Walter Walsh. Well, you have Walter Walsh 11, 12, 13, and 14, and possibly more. Now, for various reasons, the population data reported by this census came to be viewed as being untrustworthy because a belief took hold that it had, ex it had exaggerated the national population. Now this idea was introduced in the 1841 census report and that claim basically accused the 1831 enumerators of falsifying their returns to earn more money because you were paid on the basis of the number of people that you counted. So if you made up people, manufactured uh, for, uh, people who didn't exist, well, you were going to get more money. So this was a claim that was introduced in 1841. And that claim has stuck around for the last 180 years, or almost 180 years. But it's now, uh, that claim is now known to be substantially incorrect. And the survey is coming to be recognized as actually the most accurate of the four pre-famine Irish censuses. 
Nonetheless, because the census had not recorded the names of all people, it was routinely overlooked by early, early genealogists who favoured the 1821, 1841 and 1851 surveys, all of which had complete lists of names. And because of this, transcripts from the 1831 census are quite rare. So that's why um, Walsh Kelly's transcription of Aglish and Portna Scully is quite important. Ironically, despite its preeminence in terms of accuracy, it's the only one of the four pre-famine censuses which was completely destroyed in the Public Record Office fire in 1922. There is not a single fragment of a single page from the 1831 census known to exist, at least to me. Why was this fascinating? Why do I say it was a fascinating census? I say it was fascinating because it's the only Irish census ever to have been entirely rechecked. Now this situation came about as follows, it came about in a most curious way. Three years after the census was completed, Parliament established a commission to inquire into the availability of education and religious instruction services in Ireland. And because it was looking at to determine the availability of religious instruction services, it was deemed necessary to determine the religious populations at parish level. So the commission were given the power to conduct a new census of Ireland inquiring into religion. Now this is only three years after Ireland had been enumerated in 1831. That was going to be enormously costly and it was going to take a lot of time. So to expedite matters and to reduce the cost, they decided instead to do the following. Now, just listen to this just to appreciate the scale of what they did. They organised for the entire census of 1831 to be copied entirely, 1.25 million names and all the, numer all the numerical breakdowns of the households, copied entirely. Those copies of the census, so now, there's now two, two censuses, the original census and now complete copy of the census. Those copies were then returned to the enumerators from three years previously, or if they weren't available, alter, uh, alternates. And the enumerators were then required to provide the number of Catholics, Protestants, Presbyterians and other Protestant dissenters in every household. That could be done from personal knowledge, because there were local people in the parish, so they may have known, or else by individual inquiry, going back and asking in the, in the households. And also Church of Ireland, Catholic and dissenting Protestant clergymen were invited to submit new censuses for consideration by the Commission. Now this was truly a mammoth task. In order to ensure accuracy in the returns, public meetings were organised in every parish or in every group of parishes in the country, right across the country. Remember there's two and a half thousand parishes in Ireland where people including the local clergymen, could attend to verify the information. In advance of these public meetings, the enumerator's work was to be on public display for at least two weeks so that their information could be checked. In some cases, clergymen of the different denominations squabbled over the religion ascribed to certain individuals. One would say, that person's a Protestant, and the, Catholic, the priest would say, no, it's a but they attend mass <laughs> and there are stories in the newspapers about these but the important thing for us to remember is that since the census was essentially being rechecked by this work of the of the public instruction commissioners it's not credible to argue as the 1841 commissioners had that the 1831 census overestimated the population because any fraudulent counts would have been clearly and publicly exposed at these parish meetings. The 1831 census reported the 1831 populations of Inishteague and Clonamory parishes in east, eastern Kilkenny at 3,221 and at 777 respectively. And the public instruction commissioners subsequently found the denominational breakdowns in the two parishes to be 91.7% Catholic 
and 8.3% Protestant. And this is the information that's available in the published report of the, of, by the Public Instruction Commission. So it gives the parish, and for each parish it gives the number of Church of Ireland, the number of Catholics, the number of Presbyterians, and the number of other Protestant dissenters. And this is after the public meeting process. So these were the agreed or the set figures. As was the case for all parishes in the country, the censuses of, for Inish Teague and for Clonamory parishes would have been copied by the public instruction commissioners in 1834 for the purpose of their inquiry into denominational breakdowns in the, in the country. But in this case, this would not be the first time that the Inish Teague and Clonamory censuses had been copied, but it would be the second time. Now, the 1831 census of Woodstock Estate. Now, as Anne said, and some of you will remember, in January of last year, uh, the, director, the deputy director of the Beyond 2022 project, Dr. Kieran Wallace, gave a talk via Zoom during pandemic days uh, to the society about the Beyond 2022 project. And uh, as, as I understand that the following day, Kieran received an email from Nuala Roach, the branch manager in the city library, who informed them that a census of Inish Teague dating from 1813 was in the possession of a private individual in Kilkenny. Now, as I was the census specialist in the Beyond 2022 project, Kieran contacted me about this. Now, he sent me an email, and I do have to put my hands up and say my initial reaction was one of scepticism. I thought it was unlikely to be particularly exciting because I've heard this before. <laughs> And I figured that it was probably going to be nothing more than an extract from a census report or something like that. Images promptly followed, and to be quite honest with you, I was blown away by what I saw. And the importance of this census was immediately obvious to me. And a meeting was arranged in Kil Kilkenny Library at which the census would be produced and be available for imaging for the project. I travelled to Kilkenny and I met with Daphne Code, the custodian of the census, and Carmel Cummins, and with Nuala and with Anne to conduct an initial examination of the census. Now, just in summary, this census is a unique item. It is not an original census taken in 1831. The original census was destroyed in the 1922 explosions and fire in the public record office, and that is it. The original census was destroyed. But it is a transcription of the original work, which was taken from the original census return, I believe, before the original was sent to Dublin. So it was taken in 1831. It is almost contemporaneous with the census, uh, with the taking of the census. And excitingly, the transcription was written on a, an original census notebook. So it's an original notebook that was used. So the census enumerator, the notebooks that he used to take the original census, he gave one of these notebooks to the person who, enum who tr took the transcription. And it is, I believe, the only original notebook in existence. And that's really exciting. To me, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we do with this census? Well, so anyway, we got down and we had the meeting and it was a very interesting meeting and we sat and we talked about the census and the census was sitting in, on, in an envelope on the table and we chatted about it before we, 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 we actually opened the envelope. And when I opened the envelope and took the census out, uh, my initial reactions and responses were that it was truly a wonderful item, a uniquely important source. It was imaged on the day, and the census was immediately prioritised by the team for inclusion in the virtual Treasury of Ireland, which was launched in June of last year. Appreciating its significance, I took full responsibility for the census and examined it thoroughly in order to summarise and contextualise it for users of the virtual Treasury. Now, of course, 
I'm not from Kilkenny. I don't know the, the nuances of the of the area. So you may find some people with more with better local knowledge may find that some of my interpretations uh, need to be adjusted. And I'm always uh, uh, open to suggestions for how that might be done. Now, what did we do? We applied our handwriting reading model to it. So this is where we took we, we took the images, the photographs, and we ran software on it. And this software reads the handwriting and transcribes it into searchable text. Okay, the software is called Transcribus and it's very, very good. We, it, it, was, it, it can be taught to teach hand, to read handwriting and then churn out searchable text. The accuracy rate of it is in and around 90%. But for some items, which we consider to be of the highest priority and of the greatest importance, we go to the trouble of checking the text against the handwriting and correcting the errors. The census of Inish Teig is an item which we consider to be of the highest priority. So I took care to correct any errors that I could find in it after passing through the transcribus process resulting in what I hope is a perfect transcription of the census. And again, if anybody is looking at this in the virtual treasury, and remember this is available in the virtual treasury of Ireland and is publicly available to everybody for free to, to use and to, to examine. If anybody notices any errors, which may have slipped through, I'd be very pleased to correct them because we do want to have a perfect copy of this census. And thanks to the work of many individuals in the county, including Daphne and Carmel and Nuala and Anne, and the, the Kilkenny Archaeological Society and others, the census, as I said, is now freely available, open access in the virtual record treasury of Ireland uh, for all of you to look at. So let's have a look at it and see what it tells us. The census is a small, elongated, quite modest looking volume with soft decorated covers and a leather spine. Now this is an image that I've taken from the virtual treasury. If you go onto the virtual treasury, this is what you'll see. So this is the front cover of it. The title page of the census is very interesting. It describes it as a census of the population of the estates of William F. Ty in the county of Kilkenny taken in 1831 and copied from the government returns, transcribed by Thomas W. Inns. So straight off, just from the title page, you know it's not an original because it's transcribed by Thomas W. Inns. That's really important. It shows straight off that it's not an original census. By good fortune, we can identify Thomas Inns in the census on page seven. Inns was the master of the schoolhouse in Inishtig village, supported by Mr. Ty. And this knowledge is crucial for determining the provenance of the census. This is how we know that since the trans census was transcribed by Inns, a local teacher, we can confidently propose that it was transcribed by him from the official census returns before the official census was sent to the, from the area to Dublin. So although no date is recorded on Inns transcript, which I kind of find curious myself, it's near certain that it was created in the latter half of 1831. If the census was transcribed by somebody in Dublin, well then clearly it would have moved to Dublin uh, 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 before the transcription. On page 15 of the notebook, we see the name of the enumerator. The census enumerator for Inishtig Parish was a man called Richard Power. So he appears in the census as well. On page one, we can find Richard Power in the 10th house in Inishti townland. The organization and layout of the small volume provides additional evidence as to its provenance. The volume is structured as follows. Three pages at the start list the 14 questions that the enumerator was required to determine answers to. And there's 
well, it's not quite readable, but this is just a list of, this is a sample of a list of the, of, of the questions that were being asked. So there are three pages listing the questions that were required. Following that, five pages of instructions are given for the enumerator. They tell him how he was to go about his task, what he was to do, how he was to approach uh, the, the, the task. And I love this one here because it's showing him how to count, uh, how to record the counts for four strokes and then another stroke for five, so making it very easy to do. So uh, five pages telling him how to do his tasks. And interestingly, one page showing the declaration that the enumera enumerator had to make when submitting his data. Right? So I, oh, I, and in this case it'd be I, Richard Power, because that was the enumerator, appointed for the parish of Inish Teague in the county of Kilkenny for the purpose of taking an account of the population and so on. So this was the, the oath that he had to swear at the special sessions when he, when he produced uh, his census return, swearing that he had taken an accurate return. And then, following that, there are 25 double pages presenting the census uh, information, the census results. One of the pages is blank, so 24 double pages contain uh, uh, people's names and details and one blank page. And each of those uh, 25 pages uh, contain a table of 26 columns where the enumerator recorded as population information in response to the questions asked in the census. The table required details in, detailed information on each house including the name of the householder, the number of families in each house, some houses had um, multiple families. The principal occupation or the chief occupation of the family or families. The number of males and females, so that's giving you the population in aggregate. The number of males and females, number of males over 20 years old and their occupations. And the number of servants of 20 years of age and upwards. And that is what a single double page looked like. This is page two of the census, and it's giving the names in the first column. Second column is for the townland, so it's in uh, number of the house, and then information on houses, information on the number of families, then information on the number of people, the population data, and then the occupational data. Right? And quite detailed occupational data as well, listing the names of, or the types of occupations. So it's really, really detailed information. If you're from Inish Teague and your family come from Inish Teague, you get a lot of information here. Now, the provenance of the notebook. Given the contents of the volume, and particularly the inclusion of the list of questions, the instructions to the enumerator, and the blank enumerator's declaration, coupled with the fact that it appears that the transcription was compiled before census, Powers' census left the district, we can be confident that this volume is an original 1831 census notebook. We can be quite confident of that. We can be certain of that. It would have been provided by the census office to the enumerators all around the country, including to Richard Power and NHD. Uh, and Power must have given it then to Inns, Thomas Inns, the schoolmaster, to compile his census. And although the census, it's a surviving census, although the census is not Power's original work, because that was destroyed in the public record office fire, the fact that it is an original census notebook is what makes this document unique. The only, as I said, the only surviving uh, 1831 census notebook in existence. The area covered by the transcription of the Woodstock Estate census data, well, it's, it's the area shown in orange here. The, the black lines show you the parishes in question. Uh, so Inishtig and Clonamory Parish. Clonamory, should, that text should actually be down here because this is Clonamory here. Dysart Moon 
and Dungarvan. So those orange areas are the areas covered by the census. And just because I had mentioned Aglish and Port Leash, or Ag Aglish and Port Scully earlier on, I popped those down just to show uh, where they are as well. But th those areas are the Walsh Kelly transcripts, and they're nothing to do with our census of Inish. <coughs> So the, sense, the areas covered by the census are a contiguous area in East Kilkenny consisting of the eastern part of Inish Deeg, parish, this bit here, all of Clonamory Parish, part of a townland in Dysart Moon Parish, it's Brownsford townland, and a detached area consisting of a single townland, Bramblestown townland, in Dungarvan Parish in Goran Barony. So that's the area covered by them. As you can see, it's only a very small area of the county. What does this tell us about Inish Deeg in 1831? Well, the area covered, this is a, a, a close-up map of the principally the two parishes, Inishtig and Clonamory, the area covered by the census is the area shown in blue. The eastern part of Inishtig, including the, including the village of Inishtig. Um, the townland in Dungarvan Parish, Bramblestown townland, is not shown on the map. That's further north up here. There are 412 households named, 412 people named in the census living in 399 houses. Notable re residents are William uh, Ty of Woodstock Estate himself, um, William Carroll, the parish priest. Earlier on, we saw Carrigan's transcription of w William Carroll for 1821, uh, and he's still alive in 1831, and he's still the parish priest. Uh, the rector appears here, in the census, Richard Pack, the rector of Inishdee. It gives us wonderful summary data for the entire parish of Inishdee, allowing us to determine the proprietors of the townlands which were not part of the estate. So, as you can see, um, for Inishdee there, the parish, where because it gives us summary information for the entire parish, noting the owners of the townlands, we can determine the land holding in the entire parish, even though the entire parish wasn't, wasn't covered by the estate. So for instance, John Green owned these four townlands, these four townlands shown in green at the top of the parish. So that's because we get summary information as well, which is really, really uh, very useful. It makes the census even more useful because even though it doesn't list the names uh, for the areas beyond the blue area, it still gives us information on the land hold, or the landowners. And it also gives us, uh, the summary also gives us information that Reverend William Carroll, the parish priest of Inish Teague, in 1826 conducted his own census of the parish and the population then amounted to 3,323. He says, independent of beggars and lodgers, uh, which might come to 30. So he gives us a, so Carl's census counted 3,353 3, in 1826, but in 1831, the population was slightly lower, 132 lower. And he says this was caused by emigration. So even before the famine, the population of the parish was starting to decline. You know, the traditional idea we have is that the population continued to rise up until the famine, but at least in the Inish Teague area, it was falling prior to the famine uh, caused by, and, and the reason was, uh, according to power, caused by uh, um, emigration. There's so much we can do, about, do with this information. The data allows us to examine various aspects of Inishtig's history. We can look at household size, for instance. So this is a plot of the size of households on the Woodstock estate. And as you can see, well, there's one household here with 22 people living in it. Right? That was Woodstock House itself, mostly, uh, I think, 16 servants or so in, in, in that house. So that's the largest household on the estate. 
but the mean household size, the average household size in the parish was, um, ooh, I've lost it. Does it say it there? 5.7. Yeah, 5.7 was the average household size. That's quite large for, for, for this, this uh, period. Uh, and the most, the, 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 the number of households, uh, well, the modal household size or the most common household size was six, just ahead of seven. So these were, were, were quite large. And if you look at rural against urban, as in rural area against the village of Inishti, the household size in Inishti itself in the village was slightly larger again than in the rural areas, which is what you would expect because again, uh, um, you're looking at servants in, 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 in those instances in urban areas. So one very useful uh, um, aspect that you can examine is household size and it's giving you really, really detailed information. This is completely aside from the whole genealogical uh, information that you will get from the census anyway. It gives us fantastic information on, on, on occupations. Uh, very, very detailed information on occupations. And it's no surprise to see that um, agriculture was the main occupation in the parish. Uh, that's as we would expect for 1831. Um, seven of the 13 questions to be answered dealt with matters concerning various aspects of people's occupations. So that was a key focus of uh, any census inquiry at this time. So agriculture was the main occupation. Within the village, retail was important, uh, was much more important in the village than in rural areas. Again, as you would expect, but it's nice to see what we might expect being confirmed by uh, statistical data. The area produced raw materials and exported them. There was very little manufacturing in the area. Carpentry was common. Linen weaving was common in the area and, and, and uh, manufacture of um, various types of clothing and cloth was common. And the one person, there's only one person who's recorded in specific in manufacture, who's detailed as manufacture in the census, and that was Robert, Robert Allen of Coolnamuck in Clonamory Parish, who was engaged in the manufacture of flour. And power, very for, uh, fortuitously, even though the uh, seven columns were related to um, occupations, power was only required to put in numerical figures in each of the columns. But what he did for us, and he did us a real favor, he actually notes the occupations in many instances. So you can see, even though he wasn't required to do it, he'll note that somebody was a baker and somebody was a, a farmer and somebody was a policeman and so on. So he even went beyond what was required of him uh, to give us much more occupational information that, than, uh, than was required. Carpentry, I said, was the most common occupation and smiths, coopers, stonemasons, fishermen and boatmen were also common. Boatmen and fishing on the, on, on the river were quite common. There were 27 adult male carpenters, 16 coopers, and 15 smiths in the two parishes. And we can get all of this because power gave us a lot of this information. Now, some other information. Abstract data for the entire parish. Yes, there's the population of the entire parish, 3,221. There's, pa there's Carl's 1821 population, so you can see it's a little bit higher. And there's the uh, remarks by the enumerator. And he also, uh, Inns also transcribed, or recorded the names of the Protestant householders in the, in, the, in, in the census as well. So he gives us a list of all the Protestant householders and the number of people in their families. And the reason he has that is because of the public instruction commissioners in, 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 in inquiry as well. So he lists all of the, Protestant householders as well. And I will say, I have a very strange link. I'll just tell you this, just, uh, I have a very strange link with this census uh, myself. My family come from a small little townland near Red Cross in County Wicklow called Rahavel. And my, great, my grandfather was called William Ward. 
And the house beside us, we came from Rahavel House, and the house beside us was called Rahavel Hall. And uh, there was a man living in Rahavel Hall, Rahavel Hall when I was a young fella. His name was Harvey Heveter. And while I was working through this census, now that's a very strange name. I've never come across Heaveners before. And Harvey Heaveners is a very curious name. And because I was, um, when I was working through the census, I came across the name Harvey Heavener. And it was the first, I had never ever come across the name other than the Harvey Heavener who lived in Rahavel Hall uh, when I was a young lad. And I was talking with my cousin who still lives in Rahavel House once. And I just told her that we had discovered this wonderful, we had come across this wonderful census of Woodstock. And I said, you're not going to believe it. I came across the name Harvey Heavener in the census. And my cousin said, but that's the Heaveners who live next door to us in Wicklow. And I said, no, it's not, because this census is from Inchteag in County Kilkenny. It has nothing to do with Wicklow. And she says, yes, she says, the Heaveners moved from Inchteag to Rahavel <laughs> in the 1920s. And sure enough, she sent me on an article, a local history journal, which described the Heaveners moving from Inchteag, from Woodstock Estate, over to Rahavel. Uh, in the 1920s. And of course, if anyone else on the project had been working on this, it wouldn't have meant any, any, anything to anybody, but it was just that I knew Harvey Heavener from Ravel Hall, and there was a Harvey Heavener in the census in Inishtig, and I happened to be talking to my cousin who happened to know that they moved from Inishtig <laughs> to Ravel. And the Heaveners are still living in Rahavel Hall, so I sent my cousin on a copy of page number seven, image page number seven, where Harvey Heavener is there, and that's her great great grandfather who moved from Inish. That's her great great grandfather appearing in the census in 1831, who was the grandfather of the person who moved to Rahavel in the 1920s, which I thought was quite a remarkable uh, uh, coincidence. Now, uh, before I get on to, I'm going, just going to conclude. Since most of the pre-famine Irish census returns were destroyed in the fire in the public record office in 1922, it's always noteworthy when a new extract from a pre-famine census is unearthed. It happens very rarely. Thomas Innes's transcription of the 1831 census of Woodstock Estate <coughs> is a real gem, and it's as close to the original return as one can hope to get, simply because it was transcribed just after the census was conducted. And it's even different from, say, Walsh Kelly's transcriptions uh, of Aglish and Port Leash, because Inns was transcribing it at the time it was conducted. So if he had an error with a name or he couldn't read a name, he could check with Doyle. He could, he, Doyle with, or Power, he could check with Power to, to see if his data were correct. Walsh Kelly was transcribing his data 80 years after the event. So this is as close to the original as we can hope to get. The Beyond 2022 team were pleased to learn of the existence of this unique item during the course of the project. And as I said, it's now freely available to researchers through the Virtual Record Treasury of Ireland. Power's census return provides researchers with an important view into the social and economic structure of the Inishtig area in the pre-famine period. We expect the document to prove of great interest to genealogists and to historical researchers interested in the demographic history of County Kilkenny. And to summarise, the census of the Woodstock estate is not an original census. It was transcribed by Thomas Inns, a local schoolmaster, from the official census returns before they were sent to Dublin. It's a unique item and it is truly a county treasure. We must be grateful to Daphne that it has survived and our family that it has survived. And we and the Beyond 2022 project uh, are thankful to Carmel and to Nuala and to Anne and to others for bringing it to our attention. The census of Woodstock Estate is a treasure of County Kilkenny and we on the Beyond 2022 project were pleased to make it available to anybody interested in the history of a small corner of South East Kilkenny. So thank you very much for listening to me. And I will say the census is available in, in the virtual record treasury. You can browse to it and you'll be able to see it in there.
right? You can see our little description of it here, giving as much information as we could. So we tried to contextualize it, describing it. And further down, we have the census itself. So it's a, as I say, it's freely available. And I'd encourage you all at least to have a look at it. You'd never know what, what you might find out. And maybe you'll find out find somebody like Harvey Heavener who has a link to me as well. So thank you for listening to me um, and I hope, uh, I hope you